My name is Tania Holsey, and today we are going to be talking and sitting down with Susie Kraybacher, the founder and CEO of Haiti Children. Today you can expect to discuss the ongoing Jamaica mission, what's going on with the children in Haiti, as well as Susie answering supporter questions. This is a really exciting interview and I can't wait to bring you on for the ride. Well, today I have the incredible Susie Kraybacher. She is the founder of Haiti Children. Hey. Hey. I've been so looking forward to talking to everybody. It's been a long, long time. Yes, it has. And I'm so excited that we're here today to go ahead and jump right in. As CEO of such an impactful organization, do you have any morning rituals or routines that help you start your day on the right foot? 100% and ritual is a good word because I start every single solitary day the same way when I can. Um, sometimes when I'm traveling, like in Haiti, it can be very difficult to, I like to go outside and do my prayer, um, but sometimes that's not possible <laughs> in a war zone. Yeah. Um, but I do like to say my prayers outside. I like to look at the sky. Um, I read my Bible for about an hour. Um, and then I try, I, I try to put some praise songs on while I'm, you know, getting ready for the day, taking a shower, brushing my teeth, whatever. But yes, very, very, I, I cannot, I cannot be at peace until I do that in the morning. Yes, that's a really good routine. And when you're deep in the work and it feels overwhelming, is there a certain memory or moment that brings you back and recharges your sense of purpose? Yes. And I I kind of prepared myself emotionally because memories right now are, it's, it seems like all of them are emotional because I haven't seen the kids in so long. Um, I get to talk to them a lot over the phone, sometimes Zoom. We do have good internet in Haiti at the campus. Uh, we, as of the last year, it's been we've been able to get Starlink, and it's worked phenomenally. Um, plug for Elon. But <laughs> in Jamaica, it's been more challenging because of reasons that those of you who have been following our our saga there, the priests who are running that orphanage has have cut off all my communication with my children there. We do have some little inside routes that those priests do not know about. So I do get to hear um, some of the things that are going on there. But as far as memories, yes, the memories of when they were babies, when the first time I saw them walk or smile or laugh or the first time they were silly after being sick. You know, usually when we find the children, they're in terrible situations. Our mission as Marcy and Sharon has always been to rescue children from the most difficult of circumstances. A lot of times in trash piles, um, in front of morgues, we've even found one child in a sewage canal. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the children are rescued from pediatric units where they've been abandoned, often due to a disability. So. When I see those children after Haiti Children has had them in our care for a few months, the first time that they let you touch them without screaming or because they're all traumatized. Every child that we've ever taken in is traumatized from usually abandonment or possibly what they've seen while they were abandoned. And bless your heart for taking your platform and using it to help these children. And with that being said, Susie, I've seen firsthand the enormous challenges you face with relocating the children from Haiti to Jamaica. What has been the most difficult aspect of this transition, both emotionally and logistically? Um, I would say that logistically was, in my opinion, going to be the greatest challenge. It required a ship, former Marines, former SEALs, um, a huge amount of weaponry, helicopters, strategic planning for over 14 months. I really thought that that would be the most difficult um, accomplishment, but it's really the, the most difficult thing has been emotionally after accomplishing all of that with the help of prime ministers, ambassadors, senators, people praying, 
-hmm. after all that was done and I was able to get up in front of my church and praise the Lord that it was accomplished safely after those children landed and got off onto that pier and I saw them that was like for me that was um it was the best day of my life I had no idea that after a few months we would lose contact with the children so emotionally that's been a nightmare a nightmare is the perfect word for it um I know firsthand that you've done everything you could to reach the children you've tried to fly to go see them and unfortunately that ended up in a pretty traumatic situation for you being detained and assaulted by airport staff in Jamaica while trying to access them can you share how you coped emotionally during and after the overnight detainment well that that's the first time that I've ever been jailed in my life and I've always thought that I could handle anything I've had so many times I've had a gun pointed to my head or to my chest. And I was a little bit thinking that I was anesthetized to that sort of drama um, because it happened so frequently. But to have someone tie your hands behind your back and make you plead for mercy, which is what happened to me at the Jamaican airport. Um, and my my attorney was outside of the this um place where i was imprisoned knowing that i was in there and they would not let me make a phone call or um speak to my attorney i was held brutally without any charges and put back on the plane deported the next day um emotionally i did for the first time time in my life i got um, some emotional support from a doctor mm -hmm. um I've been in group therapy for that. I've, I've come out stronger. I have absolutely come out stronger. I know now what I can handle. So uh, that I'm not afraid of that anymore. And Susie, um, first of all, we're all so glad you got out of there. But most of all, we've all been praying for you. And it's so refreshing to hear that you're just feeling more energized and ready to fight for the kids. So thank you again for all that you do for them. And speaking of that, that leads us to another situation with the deportation of the caregivers, many of whom have been with the children for most of their lives. It was heartbreaking for everyone. What was the emotional impact on the caregivers themselves after being deported? Well, the, the caregivers, as you said, most of them were raised at the orphanage, the Haiti Children Village, and then grew into um, being trained to be employees for us under our medical staff, our medical pro pro uh, professionals. And they know the children from the time that they were first placed in the orphanage. They were raised together and then they were trained to become employees. And that was really a big dream of many of the children to one day work for the orphanage, the institution, the organization that is responsible for saving their lives. So we were so honored to have them have this dream and to see it to fruition. So when, when they were invited to Jamaica to come and be with the 59 children as caregivers, that was a really big deal. Um, getting their passports, um, helping them create job descriptions. And then when these caregivers who loved those children, those 59 children who they knew intimately from childhood, saw them being abused, neglected, and let the U.S. office know me specifically with videos and audio of the abuse. They were suddenly deported. Um, they were rounded up by the police, taken out of their beds, uh, in the news, it said that they had run away, that these caregivers were at large. Was the, um, the, I think they said that, that they were at large and there was a manhunt, um, that they had run away and they were gangsters in disguise. All of these caregivers are Christian people who do the same routine that I do every day. They pray the minute their feet hit the floor. 
they're braver than I've ever been. And to be called gangsters in disguise because they told on a couple of self-aggrandizing priests, it's just, it's deplorable. And to be sent back to the war zone because these priests were afraid to be told on. They cut off all access to me. When I came down with the video on my cell phone of the abuse to confront them, I was I was taken tied up at the airport and thrown in jail, abused. That is absolutely awful. And I actually was reading the story that one of the caregivers sent to us and she primarily watched after baby Joe. Yeah. yeah. So there's one thing that really stuck out to me was like you said, her strong faith. These caregivers are risking their lives for these children. All of us at Haiti Children are doing everything we can to ensure their safety and protection. But we will keep you guys updated as this is a developing story. And we just hope and pray that you guys are in it with us and continue to support us. And with that being said, here's a question that we keep getting all of the time. How are the children in Haiti doing right now? Well, that I can say with relief and a smile, they are doing wonderful. I would never have thought that the, ha the children in Haiti in the middle of a war zone would be less um, fearful than the ones that actually got rescued. They are behind secured walls and it's not that it's always safe. There's, there is still gunfire, but we do have security. Security is expensive. Um, those kids still are trying to go to school. They can't walk to school without someone walking with them who is armed. So we we are um, we're also always at the mercy of the circumstances of whether we can get food there or not. There are times when the gangs actually give us permission. They're kind of like a, a government. They're kind of like a de facto government that they will at times give permission that the citizens can pass on a certain road during these hours. And that's when we go. And we've been able to maintain our supplies because we A, have security, and B, we are um, non-combative and try to obey the orders from this de facto government of when we can safely go for our supplies. And it is a huge relief, first of all, to hear that they are doing well. And it's even more relieving to hear that they have armed security as they go through the surrounding area as needed. And with that being said, since luckily we're able to protect them physically, but like you said, many, all of these children come to you traumatized. So how does Haiti right. children make sure that their emotional and mental health is also protected during such a nightmare of a time for them you know um god used my experience of child abuse to realize how important it is that the physical well-being is just one aspect of a healthy child the emotional and psychiatric well-being after being abused must be addressed we we Every child that we've had comes to us with emotional, psychological issues of abandonment, sometimes abuse. So early on, we hired a wonderful um, psychiatrist, child psychiatrist, pediatric psychiatrist in Haiti. And she set up a team in Haiti many years ago to help us through that process. After the war started two years ago, um, it's been more a, of a telehealth program with her. And at times, she's been unable to actually reach a, a, a situation where she can get internet. So we have the most amazing gift of the Mount Sinai Department um, of Child Psychology that it's run by um, Dr. Potts. And Dr. Potts has put together a team of doctors who specialize in 
child psychology. So we've been able to maintain, and at times they've been able to actually come and stay on the campus for months at a time and help each child individually, which has been great because with children, they don't open up. They yeah. need to gain your trust. Yeah. So that makes it when, when they're able to visit and when any of our health care professionals are, were and will be again able to visit, it really is, is an, a tremendous blessing. For right now, we're starting the program again um, in the fall of doing the telehealth with Mount Sinai again for the end, especially for the caregivers who were returned, two of which were jailed. All of them were detained and forcefully taken from their beds, detained and loaded on a ship back to the same place they fled from but this time without guns to protect them. They were dumped on the shores of Haiti. And I'll pause right there because when I was reading Vinette's story, how you said they went back to Haiti with no guns, no protection. Vinette said, although she was terrified to go back to Haiti, she felt safer there because the Jamaican government treated her so terribly. And it's so important for there to be more awareness about this situation disabled children who are now in jamaica without knowing anyone inside yeah. that orphanage the lesser disabled children are often seen in photographs and media social media especially um of the priests laughing and playing with the less disabled children and yet i have not seen any of uh, especially the 20 children who were taken to Jamaica specifically to get immediate professional care for severe malnutrition. There were there was no access during uh, the war. In the last few months before they left for Jamaica, we were pleading, please get these kids out here. The Miami Herald, it, uh, Miami Herald covered this story blow by blow. These children will die if they do not get to Jamaica and get the proper specialized care that they need. Well, since those particular children had been there, our doctor, the last time he was able to enter the gate of this orphanage run by these priests, he photographed these kids in the worst state of malnutrition that I have ever seen. And he pleaded that and, and, and wrote um, reports that these children, 20 of them to be exact, must get specific specialized malnutri malnutrition care immediately at the university hospital in Kingston where there is the appropriate care. The, the, there, there is only one facility in Jamaica that can treat that sort of high level malnutrition. These children all have cerebral palsy. So it's not like you can just go and um, try to nourish them back to health. So in some cases, they may need to be on temporary IV um, nutrition. But the kids are have not been I've, they've not been seen. I've sent the um, I, I, last time my my doctor was able and allowed by the priest to enter. He demanded that those children be taken out of that facility by ambulance and taken immediately to the hospital in Kingston. They wouldn't let the ambulances take them. So that's the last time I saw any evidence of those children even being in the, that facility anymore. We don't know where they are. We've, uh, via our human rights attorney, Malini Aileen, she has um, been contacting as recently as yesterday Mustard Seed for an account of all of those children, their medical records, how many of these children are prone to seizures, um, some sort of proof that they're being cared for with the medicine that our doctor prescribed, which is a, a difficult medicine, medicine to acquire in the Caribbean. So we're in the we're in a holding pattern. Like we said before, this is still developing. So we'll update everyone as we get more developments. We are 
closely working with our human rights lawyer, as well as senators, congressmen, prime minister candidates, et cetera. So please stay tuned. We are on the path to get these children saved and back into care that measures up to the Haiti children standard. And speaking of the children, you've always spoken so passionately about the futures of these children. What would you say your greatest hope for them right now is, even in the midst of all these challenges? Can you imagine hiring or having the opportunity to hire an employee that has survived what these kids have survived, shows up to work with an attitude of the unstoppable hope, faith, and ambition that they present and will continue to present. And I think, uh, I do believe that there will come a time when maybe they'll be allowed to work again in their country safely. If not, there's a possibility that maybe there are other countries in the Caribbean that need that kind of help and it's knowledge that you don't get by going to college. That's one reason why I wanted these kids to be the caregivers of the children who were being rescued to go to another country. It's because these these caregivers know what it's like to have bullets flying over your head and not running away. I don't think that, I think it would be hard pressed to find a Jamaican that would stay and not run if that were happening in Jam in Jamaica. I don't think that my children feel the stability that they had in Haiti, even though it was the war zone, because they don't speak the language there. They can't be told, okay, you have not been abandoned again. Your mother is there. She's trying to reach you. And every day we're telling your story. Mm -hmm. Every day. Your those children's names after this podcast um, will be posted. Say their names. Remember them. They're still out there. They're not they're not forgotten by us. We still care for them. We still have custody. We don't have custody, sorry. We still have um, guardianship of these children legally. Haiti children raise them. Haiti children is responsible for them. Don't stop supporting us to get them into a, a facility that will actually take care of them in Jamaica. And we don't want them to be there long term. We only wanted them to be there long enough to get the medical care that they needed. We got them there. The job isn't finished. We need people, the international community saying, okay, where are the children? Give us, show us photographs of their existence. Show us photographs of their condition today. We want to know what have you done to take care of the children with the money that you're raising to take care of these children. Yeah, so we need your voices more than ever. This is a true love project and from the heart. And for those of you who have that compassion for these children in this awful situation, again, we just really appreciate your support. And we make it a priority to keep you guys updated. And we also have a couple questions from supporters. This question is from Sue Twig from Aspen. I'll read it now. I know Sue. Hi, Sue. <laughs> Hi, Susie. Thank you for your beautiful work and continuing to persevere through all of the hardships. My question for your interview is this. How do you decide you want to adopt certain children? Do you just know that they are meant for you? I send you lots of love from Aspen. So as, as far as us adopting these children, taking permanent guardianship for them until they are able to go out into the world on their own, and we have done some adoptions. It's been difficult for us to find families that will consider taking on the lifelong responsibility of some of the more um, disabled children. Like many of our children have cerebral palsy. Some of them have con congenital heart issues. Um, some of them have hydrocephalic syndrome. And some of those conditions are a, a lifetime um, challenge for them. We, we have had such great success with so many of these kids. Some of the kids that we've gotten were considered unadoptable. However, 
some of them have been adopted. And whether or not, if you're asking me, how do I make the decision of whether or not to take them, we take them regardless. We are not an orphanage that says, oh no, we're not qualified. If we're not qualified, we hire doctors who are qualified. We don't say no. And I think that's one thing that's led Haiti children to, to be a, a shining star in Haiti is we have never said, oh, well, we're not qualified to take care of that child. If we're not qualified, then we find people who are. And we make a home for them. Perfect. And she had a follow-up question as well. Sue asked, will the children continue living in Haiti? Did they move to Jamaica or might you ever bring them home to the mountains? We have longed and dreamed of the children one day coming to the U.S. One of the issues that we face is it's nearly impossible to, even with our open borders, it's nearly impossible to get them here legally. We have not been successful in getting visas in any administration. We have not been successful in getting visas and in many cases, not even medical visas for them. That's why we turned to the Caribbean to start reaching out to prime ministers in the Caribbean. And they, the prime minister of Jamaica happened to be motivated to take our Haitian orphans only because he was encouraged by the U.S. government to take these disabled children because it would look favorable for their government to do so. Our government did not want to take those children. They are a financial burden because of the health issues that they were born with, because of their disabilities, their, their care in the United States would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars versus in Haiti with all of our volunteers. And, you know, we had neurosurgeons, we had gastroenterologists, we had um, psych pediatric psychiatrists. We had so many volunteers coming and the surgical um, suites and different hospitals that we partnered with ready and willing to do the, inter the, the necessary medical intervention, intervention or surgical intervention that it wasn't costly for us to do these things in the Caribbean. The problems that we have is corruption in Jamaica and Haiti is off the charts. You cannot, uh, and our, our doctors and our caregivers were told, I have it on audio. I, one of my very clever kids, one of my actual disabled kids had his phone on record when one of the priests was telling my doctor, you better be careful. You're in Jamaica now. Yes. <laughs> insane but it's so amazing that your kid had the foresight to go ahead and record I'm telling you these kids have been raised to be to, to know how to protect themselves they know if there's something abuse happening i'm going to record that and my mom's going to get right. a photo of that mom's that's okay. why we were able to obtain the pictures of, for example there was a video of one of my orphans. He's 17. He has cerebral palsy. He's bedridden. He is perfectly mentally um, healthy, but he can't move and he can't defend himself. There was a video sent to me at these priest orphanage. He was in his bed defending himself while one of those employees hit him with a leather strap. He couldn't have possibly done anything offensive because he can't speak. That is so grossly negligent. I, and that's a nightmare. It's just uncomfortable. It's and you know what? That's just the appetizer of the, the, the alleged, I should say, abuse. Um, we continue every day to follow what we can, and that's why we're trying to get the international community involved. We've been threatened by this organization. They've had their lawyer uh, send letters, you know, saying that be careful what you're if, if you continue to post these things, then we're going to see you. I'm like, I have nothing that you 
I have nothing to offer you in a suit. Take it. Fine. <laughs> I'm telling the truth for my children, just like any mother would. And I will protect them till the end. This organization was founded by people like everyone listening who care. They stand behind us. They know that we speak the truth, not our convenient truth. We say the hard things and we do the hard things. We take care of children, no matter where they are. If they come to us, we will take care of them. Like you said, transparency is the core of everything we do. So why would the priest want these children? You discussed them barricading, you know, exits for, you know, them to get to ambulances to get the rightful care they need. Do you have any insight as to what their motivation could be as to why they just won't, you know, let the children get the care they need? What I believe has happened is they did not likely give the children the proper nutrition that they needed. And the children probably lost weight. They probably don't want or didn't want me to see that. Um, I know that some of the children had severe bed sores. I saw pictures of really... Um, really disturbing bed sores and the kids laying in beds with flies all over them. And I had heard that the flies from the doctor, I'd heard that the flies had caused a lot of um, contagious infection. So I think that they didn't want that to be exposed. I also believe that I found out um, during the time that the Miami Herald was covering <clears throat> this story. <clears throat> I found out that the the organization Mustard Seed was getting funding from the Jamaican government to take care of these children. And so when when I um, confronted them on that, they were quite angry that I mentioned that. And then the journalist asked them directly, are you charging are you charging the Haiti children to take care of these children? I mean, is that your intent? And they said, oh, no, we, we do not charge for orphans because that's what we do. Well, um, they had asked me specifically for $767,000 annually to take care of these children. We said, no, we will not send you six hundred or $767,000 annually we take care of the children. We're paying for the doctors, for their caregivers, for their food. If you want us to pay rent for the space in your orphanage, we'll be happy to do that. Well, that's when all hell broke loose. All of a sudden, they weren't going to get the $767,000 from us. We maintained that we would continue to pay for all the medicine ourselves directly. We'd pay the hospitals directly. We would pay the ambulances directly, which is what we did. And all of a sudden, we were blocked from any access to the children. My supposition is that the money was not coming in that they expected from us. And so the level of care probably dropped substantially. And then I, again, as I mentioned, I started noticing on their social media that they were posting photographs of my children dressed up in nice little, you know, ribbons and bows, but it was the children who were the least ill and the least disabled. And I stopped seeing any pictures of the children who had been taken there because they needed immediate care for their severe conditions. So that's my speculation. Honestly, with the corruption in Jamaica is not too hard to put those pieces together. Again, we're working and hoping for the absolute best outcome because those kids need their mom. And we're so ready for that, you know, to all for this chapter to be over. And we push past. We are so ready. We are so <laughs> ready. And I know our donors are too. But, you know, we have to stick together even in the hard times. We've had a really yeah. calm season, even during this gang war. It's been calmer than this debacle. And I call it the Jamaican debacle because we got those kids there safe. 14 months of planning, praying, crying, 
pleading with God to get them there. And then this happened. Our, our ultimate goal is to get the children out of that orphanage, get them into a facility where our eyes are on them in Jamaica, keep them, get you know, our partnerships with the hospitals there to get our volunteer medical professionals coming back in and getting help there in Jamaica, but supervising the kids ourselves. And since we know their conditions, I know everything about those kids, like back in my hand, we know how to take care of them because we've had 31 years of doing that. I don't think that these, that this organization or the priests had any idea what they were getting into. I think that they thought that they were going to get some kids in wheelchairs. But these kids, some of them will be terminal if they don't get the proper care. They need 24-7 care. You cannot just have a doctor come visit them once every two weeks, which I fear is what's happening. They need 24-7 care, which is what they've had their entire lives. We have round-the-clock nurses. You don't, in the United States, even if you have a cerebral palsy baby, leave that child without constant oversight. And that's what those kids need. So our ultimate goal, a lot of people want to know, so what are you going to do? What is? It, what do we do now? We keep going. We mm -hmm. keep putting this out there. We keep sending the requests from our pro bono human rights attorney to the Minister of Health in Jamaica, to the Child Protective Services in Jamaica, to any entities in the UN that are set up to care for these sort of international um, issues for oversight for the care of children. We keep doing that. And eventually it will break loose. The kids will be back in our custody and we need to be prepared for that. We will just have to keep exposing it because the, these priests are not going to keep going if it's not financially beneficial to them. We have all the tools in the shed to take care of our children. We need them out of the care of anyone who may use them for purposes that are I don't even want to to their well-being. I totally agree. And I see it. I know they're coming back as we've all been praying, our supporters, you and I, everyone. And I know that they'll come back home and that's going to be the best day. I can't wait for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And we also have another supporter question from Barry K. And this is his message here. Hello, Susie and amazing Haiti children team. Question for the interview tonight. I have known and worked with different ministry organizations that struggle to meet financial needs. Some have closed due to lack of funding. I know that God is ultimately in control, but how have you learned to be a good steward of money? And what are the main financial risks and pitfalls that threaten your ongoing good work for the Haitian children? Thank you so much. You. Love from your old friend. Thank you so much. And I remember you well, and thanks <laughs> for remembering us. Well, I believe in transparency, transparency, transparency. Our financials are online. You, of course, can have access to them at the request and have them within probably five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we also try very hard to keep overhead low and every single child has a program. So when a donor says, where does my money go? Well, there's a program for each child. Not all programs for every child are the same. Some of my children have mental disabilities. So their, pro their child care program will be different and it will cost a, a, a different amount than say someone who's um, a paraplegic in a wheelchair. We have an extensive network of partners. This is what's kept us viable. That's probably the only way we've been able to continue and not go under like a lot of organizations have. Because we've been able to work for 30 years in Haiti, we've built a partner system that's, that's um, I think it's stellar. We have partners who give us food, uh, containers of food. I think in the last two years, we, were, we had donated from uh, Feed the Hungry and Food for the Poor, to, I think, 2 million meals. 
Um, we've had partnerships with Bernard Meds Hospital in Haiti, who have helped us get care for surgical intervention for our children there. So keeping those costs down through volunteer programs and partnerships are incredibly important. And then also telling the truth. And it's not always a happy story, but letting our letting our partners, our family members know exactly what is needed. If they can help, then they will. If they cannot, then oftentimes they know someone who can. But I'm not, um, I think I used to be a little intimidated when I first began by asking, but we're not asking for anything for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And you would ask for anything for your for your child, mm-hmm. unabashedly, you would. Mm-hmm. That's a great answer. And for the supporters who have stood by Haiti children during this complex situation, what message do you want to share with them about the current state of affairs and how they can help us directly? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really... Um, I want to post the names of all of those 59 children. I want their names out there. If you would just choose one or two of them that you would put on a post-it on your mirror to pray for every morning, because none of this happened without without prayer. It all happened because somebody was praying or a lot of somebody's were praying. I'm a woman of faith. And I never, ever give credit to the dollar because God made the dollar and he he owns every dollar. And if he cares for those children, as he says clearly that he does, then he will provide for them. It just does often take someone asking for provision. And that's sometimes writing a check or, or praying for that provision. The school year is is just about to start again. And our children, because we do have security at the moment, we want to start the school year and pray that we actually finish the school year. But to do that, a lot of people have not realized that that, that funds are still needed for books, school supplies, um, teachers, because the country's been closed. But in some pockets of the country, there have been ways to get that education continuing in in our area we are continuing education we can't go into great specific details because unfortunately gang members have access to social media too so we have to be extremely careful i'm happy to answer any questions uh one-on-one and I think most of you know how to reach me personally or someone in the the U.S. office. Tamia, thank you for always being there to answer questions. I don't know what I would do without you. And the children love you, too. Oh, I love them so much. (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine that that someday, someday we will get to go back there and they will probably have grown a couple of inches by the time we see them again. Yes. But we will, this cannot, this will, it cannot continue. Yeah. And one more question that I just thought of. So we, everyone has seen firsthand how you've affected and blessed the lives of these vulnerable children who otherwise wouldn't have had a way out. You provided them protection, food, shelter, medication emotional support, et cetera. How would you say that they've changed you personally through, you know, the Me? Oh my years? gosh, you would not believe, um, you know, we know how teenagers are here in the U S they have access to social media. They have overwhelming confidence because of their <laughs> social networks, but you would not believe how accountable these kids hold me and my husband, and you, and us, they're, you know, I, I'm proud of that. They are, they're very confident when they feel like I'm not, um, for example, in days when I am very down, when we do have, sometimes we have deaths in the organization because we take care of so many children, and some days I'll go silent for hours or maybe sometimes days and boy they are bombarding my phone i feel something's wrong with you 
tell us what it is. Don't do this to us. <laughs> what is wrong with your mommy? Oh, yeah, I could see that now.